life is a miracle. To witness a mother give birth and a child grow up, to watch the gift of life unfold over the years, all those key moments imprint on your memory forever. And this process of growth and change is fascinating. It's why we show baby photos at weddings and wedding photos at funerals. But the most fascinating changes aren't external, but internal. Not to our body as much as to our soul, to who we become. In the Christian way, this process of change is called spiritual formation. Well, I want to pray for um, the ministry of the word here in a moment, but um, just a couple things, people things um, to put on your radar to add to your prayer list. We want to extend a congratulations to Kelsey Willinga and Christian Lopez Reese, who got married yesterday in Sheldon, and it was great to get to celebrate with them. Uh, then also in way of celebration and prayer concern, uh, Levi and Brianna Vandenbrink, uh, they had their, um, their daughter Brinley early uh, a couple days ago. Um, this is, Levi is the son of Dave and Sheila Vandenbrink. Um, so they are up in Sioux Falls in the NICU and baby is healthy, mom is healthy, but um, we just pray that, that uh, Brinley would continue to grow and that her mama and, uh, would be able to hold her soon. So. Let's come before the Lord in prayer and ask God to open our hearts and minds to his word today. Oh God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Oh Lord, for your mercy that is new every day, for your goodness and your kindness towards us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of community. We've got to celebrate that today through baptism and that we're part of a, of a church family, a global church family that's bigger than just this area, that's bigger than just our country, the beautiful diversity of the body of Christ and for our, our, our beautiful Haitian brothers and sisters, Lord. We are especially grateful. Lord, thank you that you are the one who shepherds us, that you provide what we need even before we ask because you know what we need more deeply than we know. And we lift up to you today just the needs of this community we give you thanks for Kelsey and Christian, Lord, for the promises that they made yesterday and ask that you would give them the grace to live into those, those promises. Lord, we thank you for the safe delivery of Brindley and for the medical accessibility that we have for hospitals around us to be able to care for um, the Vandenbrink family right now and be with Levi and Brianna in particular. Dave and Sheila, give them a sense of your presence. We pray for this sweet little child that you would, Lord, that you would grow her stronger. And Lord, for other needs that we carry with us today, people that we're holding in our hearts, we take a moment now, just in silence, to lift them before you. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. And all of God's people said, amen. So we are continuing our fall sermon series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters five through seven. Let me just give you a quick review of where we've been. A couple weeks ago, we began with the Beatitudes and said that in the kingdom of God, God's vision for the good life is so upside down compared to what our world um, values and the assumptions of our world. And then uh, last Sunday, we're skipping around a little bit, um, but last Sunday, we went to Jesus' teaching on anger, and we talked about how anger in and of itself is not, is not bad. It's what we do with our anger, and that when we carry anger in our hearts or resentment towards a brother or sister or nurse a grudge, that Jesus says that's like murder. Or when we use our words to insult others, that's like murder, and that you may not have murder on your hands, but you can have it in your heart. And we talked about this call then to forgive and to seek reconciliation. 
Today we're going to jump to Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. So again, we're hopping around a little bit. We're doing this in part to accommodate some guest preachers that we're going to have. And I want to remind you that next Sunday, John Opkenorth, my predecessor, will be here on the Orange City campus. And Titus Baraka, our mission partner from Uganda, will be on the Hospice campus. If you haven't ever gone and worshipped on the Hospice campus, next Sunday would be a great time to go and check that out if you'd like to hear Titus preach. So hear the word of the Lord then from Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 33. This is from the NRSV. I invite you to open your Bibles, and if you have a different translation, that's okay. You can follow along. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows that you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes. And no, no, anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A couple weeks ago, I was supposed to join a Zoom call with a handful of other pastors. These were pastors that I look up to. Um, Most of them have written books. They're incredibly wise. I have no idea how I got invited to this Zoom call, but I did. And um, the purpose of the Zoom call was to talk about a new podcast that's going to be launched that is intended to encourage pastors and ministry leaders. But for some reason, I did not get it on my calendar. And that's probably because I didn't ask Tana Van Gorp to write it in for me, who keeps my life organized and in order. But I completely forgot about this meeting. I scheduled a, a coffee with a parishioner who's also a friend, and while we were having coffee, it was during that time that this supposed Zoom call was happening. So when I returned from my coffee with my friend, I checked my inbox and I saw emails from these other pastors who were very gracious, but said, hey, Brian, we missed your presence for the Zoom call. A panic shot through me. How could I have forgotten this? Such an important meeting. I was embarrassed. I wanted to save face with these pastors who I respected. So rather than just being honest, And admitting that I had just forgotten about the meeting, I sent this email. Friends, I'm so sorry I missed our Zoom call today. An important pastoral situation came up that demanded my attention. I mean, kind of. It was like a pastoral conversation. I'm sure you all understand how this goes. I will watch the recording of the Zoom call and catch you next time. Grace and peace, Brian. Every day... In big and in small ways, we are tempted to compromise the truth. We live in a culture where lying is not only permissible, but it is often encouraged and rewarded. The ends justify the means, we say. So if twisting the truth or tossing out a half-truth or even flat-out distorting the truth achieves a desired outcome, then we say, well, this, this is okay. I mean, after all, like, everybody does this. It's really disturbing to me, especially, to see some of the the bigger lies that come from people who should know better. Lies and cover-ups spoken by pastors and religious institutions. Falsehoods and fear-mongering spoken by political leaders. Celebrities and CEOs denying the truth and manipulating others as a way of, of leveraging power and preserving their brands. I mean, we are now living in a historical moment where we're talking about things like post-truth and alternative facts, whatever that means, and where extremists and conspiracy theories, which were once on the fringes, have now been brought into the mainstream. I mean, all of it is, is confusing, it's alarming. We find ourselves asking the same question that Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, and that's this. What is the truth? And who can I really trust? But here's the thing. It it may be tempting to hear Jesus' words today that we just heard 
from the Sermon on the Mount on oaths and truth-telling, and primarily this morning, think about those people or that person who is so guilty of big lies and deception. And of course, Jesus' teaching has something important to say to, to anyone who would deliberately deceive or perpetuate falsehoods or, or use their words to harm others. We will all be held accountable for the words that we speak. But if the Sermon on the Mount is at least in part, as I'm suggesting to you, Jesus' way of holding up a mirror and saying to each of us, look, I don't want you necessarily kind of looking at the person next to you, but I'm inviting you to look at yourself in the mirror and to find the courage to be honest with what you see. I find myself wondering as I prepared for the sermon today, in what ways am I lacking integrity in my own life when it comes to speaking truth? How do I have a tendency to justify my own compromises with plain speech and dismiss it as not that big of a deal? Like the email that I sent to those pastors to save face. Or like when I'm, when I'm running late for a meeting and I text the person waiting on my way when in truth I'm still sitting in my study here at the church. Or when I tell Tammy, my wife, that I'll be home by 5.30 for dinner, but consistently it's 6 or 6.30. Or when I say to someone, and I know that I've done this to, to some of you and I'm sorry, hey, we should get together sometime. I'll email you. And weeks and months go by and I haven't followed through. I'm inviting you this morning to wonder the same thing about yourself. Not to shame any of us. Like, this isn't kind of like Brian's moment of confession uh, in front of the congregation. Um, although I do have to say, I, this sermon is especially for me. But I'm, I'm hoping that it's helpful to you as well. And that's my invitation for you this morning. Not out of shame, but for us to be honest with ourselves and to hear what, what does God maybe want to say to you right now in terms of your own life and your relationships How can we become more aware of the power of our own words? And how can we become more like Jesus, not just in our thoughts and our actions? That's what we're talking about as disciples, right? We want to be with him. We want to become like him. We want to live as he lived. But it's it's also about our speech. Are we becoming like Christ with the words that we say? We talked about this last Sunday. Words matter. They do. Words matter. And as Pastor Rich Viotis put it, the degree to which we live in the truth is the degree to which we live in the way of Jesus. Can I just let that sink in for you this morning? The degree to which you and I live in the truth and live by the truth is the degree to which we live in the way of Jesus. So in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls us to be a people who live in the truth, who live by the truth. He lifts up plain, honest speech as the standard for disciples. Listen again to what he says. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows that you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, here's, we see Jesus doing this, right? Taking in the law, the Torah, and saying, I'm, I'm going to give you the accurate interpretation, and I want to press it deeper than just beyond skin-deep righteousness. I want to get it deep into the matter of the heart. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your own head, for you cannot make your hair white or black, nor do you have power to even keep your hair. Right, John? Amen. Let it be so. So what is Jesus saying here? This part of the sermon is one of the the, the shortest, most succinct parts, and in some ways, it's like, okay, yeah, I think I get it, but in other ways, it's kind of confusing to our 21st century ears. So let me see if I can kind of help give some context here. Jesus is referring in this part of the Sermon on the Mount to a common ancient practice in which oaths were essentially given as a way to give extra weight to a promise. So remember, in the first century, it was an oral culture. And what that meant, not like today, so if Michael and I are going to have a contract and we want it to be binding, we maybe sign papers and we sign our names to the the dotted line and there's something binding about that covenant contract. Um, But in the the first century, it was an oral culture where there weren't papers to sign, 
but it was your words that you spoke. A spoken oath or a promise was binding. We see this happening all over the place in the Old Testament. Now, Jesus is not saying that making an oath or a promise is a bad thing. Um, What he's addressing here, this is so important, what he is addressing is the way that many people, including the religious leaders like the Pharisees, were using oaths to be deceptive and to twist the truth. Here's how it worked. If you made a promise uh, by invoking God's name, it was binding. So if I said to Ben, Ben, I promise this to you and I promise it in the name of the Lord, that was binding between Ben and I. If somehow I broke that promise, one, I would be taking the Lord's name in vain, but two, I would be lying. I would be guilty of perjury. However, if I made a promise using other kinds of formulas like, Ben, I promise to do this in the name of Trinity Church, or I... Ben, I I promise to do this in the name of the holy city of Orange City or Sioux Center. Uh, Or I swear on my mother's grave, Ben. Um, That wasn't binding because I wasn't making the promise in the name of the Lord. So Pharisees and religious leaders were doing this all the time as a loophole, knowing it was kind of a way of crossing your fingers behind your back that as long as I don't make the promise in the name of the Lord, but I can make the promise in heaven, or I can make the promise, I can promise on the earth, or I can make the promise on the holy city of Jerusalem. Well, I actually don't have to really follow through on that, and if I don't, that's not lying, because I didn't promise, I didn't make the oath in the name of God. So do you see how that works? The Pharisees and other religious leaders were manipulating the truth in this way. They would make a promise using some kind of religious formula, but they had no intention of keeping it. And here's what was happening, is that the people who were most vulnerable were the ones who were being hurt the most. The problem then was that their words were cheap. You couldn't trust people. Even those claiming to love God, you couldn't trust them to be honest and to say what they really mean and to mean what they really say. So this is what Jesus is directly confronting here in this part of the sermon. He offers us a radical shift in perspective for those who want to follow him. He is calling us as his disciples to a kind of integrity that embraces truthfulness, and especially when it comes to keeping our promises. Jesus' argument here goes like this, that any time we speak as disciples of Jesus, any time we speak and make promises, we are called to be faithful, to be truthful. So even if we don't swear by God's name, it doesn't matter. Jesus would say, what he's saying here is if you swear by heaven, if that's the formula you're you're using, well, well, God's throne is there. And if you swear by the earth, well, remember that the whole earth belongs to God. And if you swear by the, the city of Jerusalem, well, remember that God, the great king, is king of that city. And even if you swear by your own head and your own hair, which you cannot change or control, you belong to God. Not a hair falls from your head without the will of God. It all belongs to God. That's what Jesus is saying. Heaven, earth, your hair, no hair, it all uh, belongs to God. So any promise you make, you are binding yourself to that promise. Jesus is really even going further to say here, you shouldn't have to use any kind of oath in order to get people to really trust your words as my disciples. As my disciples, when you open your mouths, simply let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Anything more than that comes from the evil one who is the the father of lies. So just to be clear, Jesus isn't saying that you shouldn't make an oath or a vow or, or sign a legal contract. Making promises are important. We did promises this morning for baptism, right? That's important. The wedding yesterday, Kelsey and Christian's wedding, they made promises. Those are important. Jesus isn't saying you can't ever make oaths or promise. His main point here is that you you shouldn't need an oath or a vow for people to take you at your word because your words matter. People should be able to trust what you say. We are called to be people who speak the truth. Let me say it again, the degree to which we live in the truth is the degree to which we live in the way of Jesus. 
So for the last part of my sermon here, let me offer some practical suggestions for what it means to live in the truth and to live by the truth. And I am taking these from Rich Viotis' new book, um, The Narrow Path, which is a great book, by the way, on the Sermon on the Mount. And he offers four things. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna borrow them from Rich, and then I'm gonna just kind of fill them out a little bit more. But again, I'm inviting you not to be thinking about how this is God's word for somebody else, but what is God saying to you today? What does it mean for us to speak the truth? First, to speak the truth means that we say what we mean. Be clear and direct and honest in your speech. Don't beat around the bush. Don't put spin on what you say. Now, we need to speak truth kindly, and it should always be flavored with grace. I'll say more about that in a moment. But to obey Jesus' teaching here means that we refuse to say something that we don't mean. We don't just tell people what we think that they want to hear. We don't do that to get their approval or to fit in or to avoid conflict. We don't use our words like flattery to try to manipulate people to get what we want. No, Jesus says we are called to really mean what we say, to say it clearly. Second, speaking truthfully means that we do what we say. We don't just mean what we say, but we do what we say. We follow through on our commitments and our promises. For those of you who have done faith walking, which is a discipleship process, you'll know that one of our definitions for integrity, and I love this definition for integrity, goes something like this. Integrity is about doing what you say you will do when you said that you would do it in the manner that it was intended to be done. Doing what you say you would do when you say that you'll do it in the manner that is intended to be done. So if I tell Tammy that I'm going to be home for dinner at 5.30, but I consistently show up at 6 o'clock, I'm not doing what I said I would do when I said that I would do it. I'm out of integrity. Or if I do get home by 5.30, but I'm grumpy and resentful because... I didn't get everything done and couldn't finish up that email. I'm not present to my family. Even though I came home when I said I would, I'm not doing it in the manner or attitude it was intended to be done, which was to be present to my family, so I'm out of integrity. Here are some other examples. Again, this is not intended to kind of evoke shame for any of us, but to just kind of help us think about this more clearly. You're out of integrity when you say that you will volunteer for something, but then you don't show up. Or when you tell your coworker that you'll take care of a task, but you don't do it when you said that you would do it. Or when you tell your friend that, th- that they can count on you to help them move on, fr- on Saturday morning, but then something better comes up and you bail on them last minute. Or when you tell your child or your grandchild that you'll take them to the park, but then something comes up at work and so you promise that you'll take them this weekend when things are less busy. In all of these cases, and others like it, we're out of integrity because we're not doing what we said we would do when we said we would do it in the manner it was intended to be done. And even when we have to make, uh, we have to break a promise, or we're just, I mean, we have reasonable, uh, a reasonable excuse for for not following through on, on a promise we made, it's important for us to understand, friends, that even when that happens, and sometimes it does, that there is still impact. There is still relational impact. For many of us, and I'm raising my hand very high right now, it's not that we don't want to follow through. It bothers us greatly when we don't follow through. We feel shame because of it, but it's maybe because we're overextended or we don't have margin or we haven't been able to say no. This is one of my key learnings right now. I I am becoming wiser. I think I'm becoming wiser. I hope I'm becoming wiser at what I'm giving my yes to. If we give our yes too quickly or without being honest about our own limits, then we're setting ourselves up and others up for an integrity gap. So third, speaking truthfully then means that whatever we speak in one place is what we speak elsewhere. That we are consistent in what we say regardless of who we are with. Do you ever express one view around one person and then an entirely different view around another person just to feel accepted by them? Or do you talk one way with one group and then you talk an entirely different way with another group? We call this shape-shifting or being a chameleon 
Or, or how about this? Do you have a tendency to talk about people when they're not around? Do you talk about Steve when you're with Bill? And then you talk about Bill when you're with Steve? I've always taken it as a reasonable assumption that if someone wants to gossip with me about someone else when they're not around, that this person is likely gossiping about me with others when I'm not around. Dietrich Bonhoeffer had a wonderful practice that he implemented when he started his underground seminary when the Nazi party was marching across Europe. And one of the practices they committed to is that they said that they would not speak about another person unless that person was present. And that meant in terms of praise, but it especially meant in terms of criticism, that they wouldn't speak about another brother, it was all men, without that person being present. And Bonhoeffer said, we did not do this perfectly. In fact, we failed often, but he says the intentionality and the practice of it transformed us. It transformed our community because we began to trust each other on a more deep level. Finally, Speaking the truth requires the presence of love. It's to mean what we say, it's to do what we say, it's to be consistent in our speech, and lastly, it's to make what we say, make sure that it's animated by love and that it's spoken with love. In our culture right now, especially on social media platforms, it's common to speak truth devoid of love. We do this in the name of authenticity or say that I'm just gonna say it like it is, but the way that we speak it is irresponsible and it's harsh and it's insensitive and sometimes it's just flat out cruel. Again, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in one of his sermons put it this way, truth just for oneself, truth spoken in enmity and hate is not truth, but it's a lie. For truth brings us into God's presence and God is love. Truth is either the clarity of love or it is nothing. I love that. It's a dense quote. What I take it to mean is that uh, Bonhoeffer is saying that if you think that somehow you're going to speak the truth, but you're going to do it without love, that is not truth. Call it something else, but it is not truth if it's devoid of love because God is love. Well, Paul would say the same thing in Ephesians. Maybe you remember this text here. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Speaking the truth in love and out of love Friends, it doesn't always mean that it's gonna be comfortable or that it's gonna feel good. It's not the same as Northwest Iowa nice. Like sometimes to speak the truth in love is, is to speak a hard, a hard word, is to have a hard conversation. But the key is, is that we're always entering into those conversations in a way that is animated by love and with speech that is flavored by love, with the intent of building each other up in love. This is hard, isn't it? <laughs> How are you doing with your own audit of your heart today? This is hard. And yet, let me just remind you that we're gonna, we're gonna get this wrong. We are human, we are imperfect in community. We're, we're not always gonna use our words well. We're gonna unintentionally, maybe even at times intentionally hurt each other. And, and when that happens, like we heard in our baptismal liturgy today, we must not despair of God's mercy nor do we continue in our sin, but we take responsibility for our words. And we find a way to own that and to clean up those messes, to be responsible for maybe how we've used our words or haven't followed through and to ask for forgiveness and to hear about the impact that maybe we've had on others because of our integrity gaps. I wonder, is there a mess maybe today, a relationship that you might need to clean up? And lastly, I would say, as we do this work together, we lean hard into the grace of God. We lean hard into the faithfulness of God, and that seems like about the right place to end this morning. With God himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, who is the model for us of what it means to speak truthfully in love and to keep our promises. God is the one who is the ultimate promise keeper. God is the ultimate covenant maker. God is the ultimate truth teller in love, but God is not just our model, God is the one who is the source of our truth-telling. 
God is the source of our faithfulness, that it is because he is faithful that we're able to be faithful, that it is because God always keeps his promises that we find the grace and the strength to keep our promises. What I wanna remind you of this morning as we end here today is that no matter what we've been through, no matter what we will go through, all of God's promises for you and for me in Christ Jesus are yes and amen. That God is always faithful, that he is trustworthy and he is true. So look to him today. Let us find forgiveness and healing and strength and the power to change in his faithful word. And as we abide in Christ and his love and abide in his words, may the word Jesus himself be the wellspring deep within our hearts from which all of our words pour out. That's what Jesus says, that it is from the place of the heart that our words proceed. And may the words of our mouths, friends, everywhere and all the time, words spoken, words tweeted, words texted, words posted, may all of our words, not some of our words, may all of our words and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and honoring to him, our rock and our redeemer. Amen? Lord, we take a moment this morning just to ask for the courage to be honest today with you and with ourselves. To have the courage to pray the prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139 to say, Lord, search our hearts this morning. Again, not in a place of shame. This is not about shame. This is about growth. It's about conviction. It's about transformation. But Lord, show us maybe where we lack integrity today with our own speech. Lord, is there a relationship that you're bringing to mind even now that we have a mess and you're calling us to take responsibility to clean that up? Oh God, we thank you that you always keep your promises. We thank you that you are the faithful one. So give us the grace to be a people, Lord, who keep our promises too. In the name of Jesus we pray, and all of God's people said, amen.